we're going to do a review and critique of Max Tegmarch Life 3.0. And it basically has a structure there where he starts with definition and foundation principles. He talks about current AI, where he, and then he talks about the near future. He then goes into a speculative future, and he finishes with the idea of goals and consciousness. So we're going to start with the idea of definitions and foundation principles. And he, the basic idea here is that a, he has life, why is it 3.0? Because life 1.0 could replicate the idea of the ability to design your own software, he thinks is only true of life 2.0 where and 3, where there's culture and myths. And we are have our cultures and myths, which basically we use our mind to develop the cultures and myths. So we have designed our own software there. Uh, then when we get into designing our own hardware, it gets into the fact that you know, designing your own hardware is something that we're seeing only existing right now with Life 3.0, the capability of technologically to design your own hardware. So basically, it's a nice walking model, this, this nine block model where we can use. And my one little caution here is that he's a physicist, and so he does bring an awful lot of physics and physics theory into the whole thing. It's, but he does then give us a really good set of workable definitions. So that's where he goes with definitions and principles. Then he gets into AI how and AI, what I'm calling AI how and AI now. When he gets into AI how, is how is AI possible? How is artificial intelligence possible? And it's, he starts with the definition of intelligence, ability to accomplish complex goals. And then he kind of puts a dividing line to talk about what is biological intelligence and what is artificial intelligence. He talks about memory and says biological intelligence, memories in the brain, and the AI, artificial intelligence, they have the capability to do memory. The other component is computation, and both of them have the capability to do computation. The last one is learning, and he zeroes in on the fact that biology is learning is, is, is through the environment, through our myths, through a, a, and we use this heuristic rule of thumb. Artificial intelligence also has the capability to develop heuristic rules of thumbs, and 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 so you will see later some of the heuristic modeling, and but it also uses this process called inverse reinforcements, which it looks at our artifacts and makes learns about us by our artifacts. And then he talks about intelligence can be narrow or broad, and good and bad. There, there's no, it's not all good. And then he kind of jumps into what is it now, all right? What does AI look like now? And he, and he gets into that deep mind with the ability to win and go and, and some of the things it did. He gets into Google Translate and into a, a cars that are a uh, uh, drive by themselves. So, so he basically did a good job, I think, of talking about how AI is feasible and possible. Then he jumps into the near future and he, you know, what I'm gonna call fat ANI and, and, and light AGI or general intelligence. And he basically picks five criteria for that. And one is the, the economy and then laws, weapons, jobs, and bugs. And, and when, when he gets into that, he, he gets into the economy. He talks about a, a AI for finance, for manufacturing, for transportation, for hospitals and drugs, for energy, and for communication. And he talks on all different criteria for those. Then he gets into the idea of, of how we can make AI safe or how we can make technology safe, how we can use AI to help within laws, with robotic judges, autonomous weapons. He talks a little bit about those. And then talks about jobs with regards to AI, what jobs make the most sense, the intercommunication jobs. And so he ties all of that together, but he, he ties it into, you know, brings it in within our existing political, economic, and social models. So, so again, I think that he, that he does a nice job here of, of insights into a broad spectrum of possibilities. And I think he did a, a, good, a good job with that. Uh, however, he does say, say what I would call stay inside the box with regards to our political and economic and socials. He jumps, shows how there's, there can be radical things happening inside, but he stays within some really fine parameters that I, that I think could be changed. Then he gets into AGI and ASI, right, which is a speculative future. And, and that's a general intelligence and super intelligence. And, and that's where he talks about the fact that there's a whole bunch of the decisions that the systems can make. And then he gets into all these different scenarios, which you read the book to see what his scenarios are. But he, he really touches upon most of the items we could think of. When he gets to ASI, he says all bets are off. And I think that that's pretty accurate. That's what everybody else is telling us about ASI. So he, he did a good job of investigating many of the alternatives, and he was very open in a lot of his, his, his discussion. Then he goes to talk about goals, and he talks about how, how, how goals are, are basically the, uh, uh, the biggest issue. But he talks about how goals uh, are 
tries to show how they're supported by physics itself. And he talks about the idea of having an ultimate goal, which is a fundamental goal. And then it has a, a set of, of instrumental goals or sub goals and sub goals of the sub goals. And it's a very hierarchical structure that he builds with regards to that. And then he says, well, so, okay, what's our target then for AI? All right, so our target for artificial intelligence as far as goals is, we want it to learn our goals, we want it to adopt our goals, and we want it to retain our goals. Those are the th three main criteria that he feels we have to do for artificial intelligence and goals. So again, he, I think he, he identifies that goals are the thorniest problem and, and, and in, in terms of, of artificial intelligence and us. But he, he does also, he's stuck again in this hierarchy and, and, and the hierarchy kind of puts him in a, a vice, if you will, because the, the, the technologies actually can, can be a, a lot more dimensional, a lot more relational than, than, a, and just, than just hierarchical. And, and so, and the other issue I think that it was, at least was an uh-oh for me is that, you know, he's looking for he's us to be the, who, and I see us as a morally inept species, to be the one that's providing the, the goals. And he also looking at our artifacts to, to provide a, uh, the goals. Uh, I think both of those are a problem. Then he also, and if you think about it, he talks about the fact that as intelligence grows, the goals improve. And so if we can show that, that, the, that the, the winning the go game was actually higher intelligence, why can't we use it for also some of the goals? So then he moves on to the idea of consciousness. And, and, and this is where, where, he, where he jumps into the idea that consciousness equals subjective experience. And, uh, yeah, and this is where he, he touches on the fact that it, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel physical, but it is physical. And the reason, it, and, and he says it's physical because it's an emergent. And emergence is a property of, of physics that we actually can measure. And he, and he talks and he goes through measuring how we do that. And, and it goes to the, uh, uh, the uh, measuring criteria that, uh, that is integrated uh, information theory. But the whole idea is that if it is physical, that it is something that we actually can re-engineer. So his, his summary is that, that basically that, that artificial intelligence plus consciousness, and even if it's artificial consciousness, consciousness can deliver and will deliver meaning. And then he talks about, you know, he supports a concept of consciousness that will be necessary for meeting. So, so that's you know, one of the positives of it that I see what he's done. But, but when I read it, I, I get this sense that, that, that he has the, the, this idea of consciousness that is a, uh, what I would call, a, you know, it, it basically shows that the humans on one side and pretty much everything else on the other side. The planet is on the other side. Most, a lot of the other species are on the other side. Uh, all, everything that we make is on the other side and even this, the artificial intelligence. And then he goes into the idea of moral responsibility with regards to consciousness. And, and, and so when he talks about moral responsibility, he talks about sentience. And, and he says that basically, you know, moral responsibility is only applied to things as we can demonstrate that they are sentient. And whereas intelligence doesn't even get a, a tick on that, on the, on the moral consciousness, a moral responsibility field. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if we actually are going to partner with technology, then you know, AI may have its own is. They may actually have a worldview, and it may actually be broader and deeper than our worldview. And, and therefore, they may also have their own ought, you know, because there is a relationship between the is and the ought. And so we may, maybe we should be using them to help us develop our values. And, 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 and we should be kind of uh, eliminating this human exceptionalism where it appears that, that, that we are the only ones that can actually come up with goals and come up with a, uh, other, other uh, consciousness criteria. So anyway, that's, where our, I, that's my review and critique of Tagmar's book. Thank you. Yeah.